Well, hello. Here we go again. Uh, we're thinking at the moment, aren't we, about how God answers prayers and times when he's answered prayers. And do you remember this wonderful quote that I showed you last week where it talks about prayer as being the greatest source of power known to human beings? Wow, doesn't that make you get a little bit interested in prayer? And to help us understand about prayer and receiving answers to prayer, we're looking at this amazing story of this girl who was born in North London about 100 years ago, uh, and her name was Gladys. Sailwood. And she lived at this time when um, the backdrop of her life was that the First World War had happened when she was a teenager, followed by this pandemic, which was a bit like our pandemic, but much worse. And then came this time called the Roaring Twenties, um, when many people turned away from God. Uh, but do you remember we heard last week that it was also a time of great revival, great Pentecostal revival on the earth. Um, and many millions were actually turning towards God and many were hearing about the gospel message of Jesus for the very first time. And Gladys Aylward had decided, even though she'd been brought up as a Christian, she thought, well, I'm not going to go along with this anymore. She even told her parents, I'm not going into a church. And then do you remember, she went to that church with those young people and she said there in that church, I found Jesus Christ. Not information, but she found a person um, and she offered her life to him and she felt in her heart that God wanted her to go to China. And do you remember she told her father, I'm going to China, and he said, you're, you, you, you'll be no good at this. The only thing you're good at is talking. And how she'd said to God, well, then I want to go to China and I want to talk about Jesus. So she'd applied to go to that China Inland Mission and she went there, amazing, and she thought, I'm on my way. She did three months with them and then do you remember they called her in and they said we're really sorry you're no good at the language it's just not your thing um you're you're um you're, you're just not good enough to go out there to speak the language. You, you'll have to do something else back home to help us, maybe. And she said to them, she said, thank you so much for all that you've done. I'm sorry I haven't learned the language, but I have learned to pray. And so she went on praying um, and she began to say to herself, if God wants me to go to China, he's going to make a way. We've got this wonderful picture now that we found uh, of the time when she then returned to London um, and she decided, I'm just going to start saving up. I'm going to plan to go to China. And do you know how she said to God, I've only got two and a half pence, I've got my Bible, I've got my daily reading notes, but I've got you. And I'm asking you, Lord, to take me to China. And then her employer almost immediately gave her that increase in pay and started to pay for her travel. Um, and she took that as a sign from God. And that's where we got to last week. So she goes on saving and she saves up three pounds. And then she feels kind of brave enough to go to the travel agent and ask them, how do I get to China? What does it cost? So she goes down to central London and speaks to a travel agent. And they say, oh, well, if you go to China, you have to go on a ship. That's the way to get to China. It'll cost you 90 pounds. And she She's thinking 90 pounds. She said, that's going to take me years to save up. That's about 4,000 pounds in today's money. And then the man laughed and he said, well, I mean, there is another way to go. And she said, yes, tell me, tell me, I'll go the other way. He said, you can go on the train. And she said, I'll go on the train. He said, no, 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 I haven't finished telling you. He said, it's so risky. It's a dangerous journey. And on top of that, there's a war at the moment between Japan and Russia. And so sometimes the railway isn't open. There's no way through across to China. Uh, it's too risky, Miss Aylward. And she said, look, you're not the person taking the risk. I am. I'll take the risk, she said. How much does it cost? He said, it'll be £47. Pounds. And so she decided, I'll save up. She said, here's three pounds I've already saved. And every time I've got a pound saved up, I'm going to bring it to you. She said, then strange things began to happen. Her employer started to say to her, would you come out with me sometimes in the evening as my companion and I'll pay you to come with me? Other people offered her extra work. People began to give her things. Her employer gave her some wonderful clothes. A friend bought her a huge warm fur coat and gave it to her. Someone else gave her a suitcase. And in just under a year, she had saved up £47. Wow. And then what she didn't know was far out in China at that time, 
a woman was praying, another woman. She was praying in this northern area in a town called Yangchen. She was praying, oh God, would you send out a young person to help me? Because this lady was 73 years old. She was a widow. She was working as a missionary and she was desperate for someone to come and help her. So she too was praying and God was hearing her prayers as well. And through a series of circumstances, Gladys Aylwood gets to hear about Mrs. Lawson and she writes to Mrs. Lawson and she says, I'm your person. It was like an emoji moment. She said, here I am. She put up her hand. I'm your person. I'm going to come out. And Mrs. Lawson wrote back and said, come, come to Tien Sing and we'll meet you there. So she begins packing up her stuff. She doesn't have much money because she spent all her money on the fair. So she decides I'm going to take all my food with me for the journey um, at, on the train. And so she takes corned beef and she takes biscuits. She takes hard boiled eggs. She takes a little stove so she can make drinks. Um, and she takes tea with her in a kettle. She takes a, a roll up bed and she takes some clothes. She takes no money apart from two pounds in traveller's checks because she thinks, well, I'm going to have all my money. I'm going to have everything with me, um, all my food on the way. So I won't need anything until I get to China. And so at 9.30 in the morning on October the 15th, 1932, this is about 90 years ago, she meets with her friends and her family at Liverpool Street Station um, and they wave her off, including the man who'd sold her the ticket from the travel agent who's become completely fascinated by this crazy young woman who's going out to China alone. So she goes on the train and she said she felt like Abraham going out and leaving his country, then on the boat and then she gets to Holland um, and begins to travel across Europe and on that first part of the journey she meets a young couple and they said we saw you at the station, what, where are you going? And they, she said I'm going to China as a missionary and they said we too are Christians, we know and love Jesus, we too are wanting to serve him, we've just been at a conference um, and we are going to pray for you. And the woman chatted with her and said to her just before she left to get off the train in Holland, she said, we, I, I'm going to pray for you, Gladys Aylwood. Every night for the rest of my life, I'm going to pray for you. And she hugged the woman goodbye and they wrote their names in each other's Bibles. And the woman said to her, if I never see you on earth again, and I don't think she ever did, I'll see you up there. I'll see you when we stand before the throne. And the man shook her hand and then she realised after they'd gone that in her hand, he had left an English pound note. And she put it into her coat where her mother had sewn various secret compartments inside her big fur coat so that she got her passport and all her stuff in there and she put the pound note in she thought well I'm not going to need that where I'm going and then the train went on out across Europe uh, she began to feel quite alone she couldn't speak the language she didn't know what people were saying um, as she started to travel through she went across Europe then through Poland and out into Russia and when she was in Russia the stations became very crowded very chaotic she could see there was great poverty it was in the years after the Russian Revolution and there was chaos in much of Russia at that time. But she travelled on and then she reached this area called Siberia where there are huge snowy mountains. It was bitterly cold and every now and then the train would stop and all around them there were forests and the men would just chop down wood from the forests and bring it in as fuel for the train so they didn't have to buy any fuel. And then slightly more scarily, in the distance, they began to hear gunfire. And she remembered what the man had said. There's a war out near that railway. And then a man got onto the train, a guard, and he began to tell the people in as much as she could understand that at the next station, they'd all got to get off. But she refused. She thought, I'm just going to stay on this train while it keeps moving. I've got to get to China. And she stayed on it, and in the end, the train stopped moving. And then she got up and she realised she was the only person left on the train. The train was deserted, so she dragged all her stuff and got out onto the platform and she realised the station was deserted. It was bitterly cold. She's in Siberia and she's alone and she cries out to God. And as she does, she sees in the distance a little shed and in the shed she finds that the men are there. They give her a hot drink, the men from the train, and they say, oh no, there's no, you can't get through to China now. You've got to go back where you came from. She's thinking, I can't go back. They said, no, you have to go back and then you'll get a train and you'll have to go round some other way to the north. And she said, well, how do I get back? And they said, you'll have to walk. And she, it was several miles. 
And so she gathered up her stuff. It was night time, it was dark. And she thought, there's only one way I'm going to do this. There was deep snow. I'm going to walk along the tracks because she knew there was no, no more trains coming. So she began to walk back along the tracks. After a bit, she stopped. She got out her stove. She made herself tea, desperately trying to keep warm. Then she realised she was so tired. So she lay down, this is extraordinary, on her suitcase. She was quite little. She was less than five foot tall. And she pulled the fur coat over her and and she slept for a couple of hours and then she woke and she was cold and she began she she pressed on with the journey and in the distance she could hear this barking and this noise of dogs and she thought what's that and she didn't know until later that there were packs of wolves in those woods hungry wolves as well and she walked on for 12 hours right through the whole of the next day and then as it began to get dark suddenly in the distance she saw the lights of the station and she thought at last and she had just enough strength to drag herself and her stuff up onto the platform and she thought surely there someone now will help me but instead some soldiers came and they looked at her and they thought, well, we don't know who you are. You look foreign. And they found her British passport. And then they sort of arrested her, took all her stuff and put her into a kind of holding area with a whole load of other people having taken all her stuff. And it was it was dark. She was hungry. Um, they'd taken her things. Um, and she's in this kind of prison. And she said it was so dirty that she'd never been anywhere so bad in her life before. And she was very desperate. She said, I prayed desperately to God for help. A bit like Peter in the Bible when he was sinking on those in the winds and the waves. It says, while he was sinking, he cried out, Lord, save me. Gladys Aylwood cried out, Lord, save me. And she felt in her coat and she thought, well, they've taken all my stuff. But she found one thing there. It was her tiny little pocket Bible. And she pulled it out and she thought, I'll read it. It will help me. But it was so dark. There was only a tiny bit of light that the ti in the tiny that she couldn't read the tiny print in the darkness. And as she stood there, suddenly something fell out of her Bible. And it was a verse that she had written out, that was printed out on a big piece of paper uh, that she'd put in her Bible. And it was written in big, dark letters, uh, bold letters. And she could just make out what it said. It was a verse from Nehemiah and it said this, Don't be afraid of them, for I am with you. Gladys Aylwood, God was calling, don't be afraid, for I am with you. She said she felt like it was a message coming from heaven, and it went right into her heart, and she thought, of course, he's still with me. This is a desperate situation, but he's still with me. What happened next? We're going to find out next week. Let's just pray. Oh, God, uh, King of heaven, Lord, we worship you. God of Gladys Aylwood, God of Hezekiah, God of Nehemiah, our God, we praise you that when we cry out for help, you hear our voice, you hear our cry. Uh, we thank you for that so much, Lord, today. Amen. Amen. <laughs>